Welcome to episode 39 of the UK Sports Chat podcast. In today's episode, I speak with 74-year-old legendary global adventurer and author Rosie Swale Pope. Rosie is running solo from the UK to Kathmandu starting on the 25th of June to raise money to support FaZe Worldwide and the charity work they do in Nepal. For those of you who don't know who Rosie is, um, she is famous for a in 2003, beginning a five-year run around the world where she travelled 20,000 miles to raise awareness for the early diagnosis of cancer, and it also raised funds for an orphanage in, in Russia. Rosie is the only person in the world who completed this solo challenge completely unsupported. She carried all her belongings with her in, in her cart behind her. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with Rosie. Um, her enthusiasm is infectious. I hope you enjoy listening to this as much as I did recording with Rosie. Have a great week and see you on the next episode. Welcome, Rosie. How are you today? I am very well indeed. Thank you, Joe. A big privilege to be on for Phase Worldwide. I'm very excited to talk to you. Yes, I'm very excited to speak with you as well. Would you, would you like to? I've I've done an introduction there, like I do on our podcast. But would you, would you like to give us an introduction to yourself, um, to it, to our listeners? Well, I am just a very ordinary runner, and I always used to think that was just a slow runner, not very good. But I have discovered that all of us can find a way through in running, and just this week. I went to see the very finest uh, shop, you know, in the town I'm in, and I got the leech shoes chosen to me by a man that's a 2.19 marathoner, and now I can run up the hill faster, and I'm pulling a, quite a big weight, about a, a, my buggy, I ran up one of the steepest hills in the area to get here, and then you stopped twice, and it's, it's, no, it's notorious. So having the right kids, I realized everyone's special. Even the people. So what I'm going to do, to tell you briefly, I used yeah. to be a sailing person, so I'm used to self-sufficiency. So I yes. became really attracted when I started running at nearly 50 to uh, passage making. So after a couple of other things, I think my second, uh, the third ever race, uh, mm-hmm. apart from the old late friendly 10K, was the Marathon des Sables because I love deserts. And so I managed, it was a magical thing, I didn't do very, very fast, but I completed it and I was so excited. And there I learned how you can carry food because, as you know, and better than me, they're very strict. They do spot checks. You can't carry somebody else's food or anything. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited. But then (laughs) after I trained by running everywhere, once I got off the trains, well, I don't mean, you know, off the transport, let's say from Wales to London, I would run everywhere. uh, And I remember putting Really, I used to do potatoes to teach me to ha- carry weight. I had a backpack, of course, then. And then I would mm-hmm. uh, plant them if they got too heavy. So there's still window boxes in Bond Street with potato plants in them, probably. And then it was so exciting. But once I'd done the race, which is a l- wonderful race and very well organized, I had thought, well, I've got the backpack. And actually, I had to run the last in the day, one of the days of the race, I had to run barefoot, which was very bad because I had to wrap my scarves around my feet because something happened to my shoes, the long story. But afterwards, I thought I had with a backpack and I had a surreal time as I ran from a rocket charity that looks after the working animals and I was blisters were tended by a vet. And then, when, so a few weeks later, or whenever it was, I can't remember the exact date, I had this desire to run across Romania because I wanted to see the country and I thought well I've got the kit I don't know what will happen and I stood on the Hungarian border because I I, I flew out to Hungary I was going to run from Romania so long ago now it's back in 1997 am I it's just boring to you do you want to hear this is brilliant I I didn't know what would happen there was I in my running shorts and then there's a policeman at the border or wherever it was and he he, I thought he was going to shoot me because he put his hand in his holster but he only got a white handkerchief to wave me on my way (laughs) I then discovered as thousands of I mean I'm only I'm only one of millions of people doing things like this but I was so excited because it's grand to have a finish line but it's also grand to have an unknown finish line every day because the in-between was amazing. I had some rules which I learned, which are still with me, right at the beginning. I never trespassed. I never asked for anything except water. 
I only I bought my food after I'm a healthy creature, where there's mm-hmm. people, there's things to eat. And I managed to have to carry it in those days with a backpack and a bivouac. Every night I slept, it, I learned immediately to sleep in unexpected places. If you slept mm-hmm. by a river, for instance, there'd be a, a thousand lovely gypsies talking to you all night long. So if you slept in a funny patch of bushes, uh, near a sort of rusting pylon, you were as safe as houses. You make a little nest uh, with your sleeping bag and all. And I had many lessons. I, I did very many mistakes with my feet and everything. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't know very much. I mean, I knew, I didn't know, I learned all the time. I, in every village I got some rant. There's always a really beautiful uh, or forestive girl in a bar or in a cafe and they'd sign my logbook. And I, I wrote about it for Runner's World, actually, at the time. It was one of only the second story I wrote for them that I write now and then, their wonderful magazine. And so I did it, and it was featured in, in the magazine. I was so proud. It took me 29 days, and I saw things I would never see if I was poor or rich. It is a yeah. special sort of wealth running from place to place, as every long-distance runner knows. And I was still slow, and my shoes weren't quite right, and everything hurt, but I thought, way to go it's the last year and you can think back on it whenever life's boring you're perhaps not feeling too good you can store it in your backpack and still carry more things and memories don't weigh anything after I became weight conscious fanatic after running long distance the first two times wow what an intro <laughs> so I, I first I first uh, came across you when I bought your book uh, just a little run around the world it must have been. I was trying to think when it was because we spoke a couple of times. Two thousand and nine. So yeah, well, I, I think I bought it about two thousand and twelve. I read it, yeah. and, there, and, and there were three things that real I could remember even now when we first connected. One was, one was that you were followed by wolves. One was there was a picture of you stood by a sign. I think you were going into Siberia, and it was saying it's not recommended to travel past here. Um, and and the other was your buggy. Oh, they, were the, they were the three things that I could viv- that I could vividly remember. Very kind to remember all that. You're amazing because you spoke <laughs> to so many famous people. But I'll tell you how it evolved. Please. For a couple of years, I was really happy, you know. And Clive was going to retire a, a bit, not totally. He wanted to do video making. We, when I did the marathon the Saab the first time, he he was had, we had commission maybe I think they paid 50 quid or something and he was going to film it it was going to be the local news it was way to go we're going to travel the world together not as he not as a runner but he could be filming and making his passion which he always had but he was always very hard working most of his life and couldn't do it and then then I did shortly after I did Marathon in 2002 a he came we came home and he he said uh, uh, something was up because he n- never went to the doctor. He hadn't been sick even with a cold for uh, all his life, really, you know, except for diphtheria when he was a kid where he was abroad or something. Not diphtheria, swine fever, sorry. And <laughs> that's yeah. something this serious. He was very strong, well. He wasn't a runner, but man, he could run better, faster than me without even any training. And then he went to the doctor and he said he had a little pain in his groin. And I thought, well, hey, do men get cystitis? I was joking. And then the doctor said, well, it's prostate cancer, but the good news is it's a great cancer if you catch it early. I expect you to be live to be 82 or 92 and catch me a big fat fish and, and start running and, and you know, uh, you'll be fine. You'll, be, you'll live to be 100 and run over by a bus. But the trouble was, it, however, there were very good NHS even then. They're absolutely stunning. But the tests showed it had spread to the bone. And in those days, 2000, 2002 and 2003, these years, where... Yeah. There was no way out. You could control it, and it was awful. And then the worst thing, it controlled it for two years. He fought it like everybody does. There's no mm-hmm. person brave, and there's no family who isn't brave. It's the, that's why my book is called Just a Little Run Around the World, because a real journey is life. And then, uh, so after that, he started having, I mean, I could nurse him at home, and he died at home, and I can do everything for a cancer patient. I learned by some wonderful nurses in the hospital he was in for a bit. Anyway, he was all right, and then he wasn't all right. You know, we're in bed and he was put. I know I'm a big fat lump, but he was pulling the bed clothes and his arm broke, you know, and that was it spread to his bones worse. And then his hip broke. And this wonderful, tough man and uh, uh, turned into a shadow, like everybody does when they've turned. And he, then he, a week before, you know, he, he died, he came home and they, the doctors were wonderful because they, they, 
a wheelchair and a hoist, all that he wouldn't need, really. And uh-huh. then he died at home looking at his favorite little bird table being fed outside in the same bed, in our bed, with me beside him, more or less. So after that, I felt he'd gone on a journey and I had to. So I thought, I don't know what to do. And then I had learned, really from the marathons, from uh-huh. the 10Ks, that in running, you don't have to use your own strength. Because you can borrow strength, can't you? All the people saying, you can do it. And all the yeah. people, in, let's say, the Mamba Marathon, which I'd done a couple of times by then, cheering you on. So I thought, so I used my family's strength. I didn't know what to do, but I became aware that you fight darkness with the light. You yeah. don't want to be, you don't look for your running shoes under the bed with a, with a, without a torch, do you, or a flat battery. So you've got to bring light gloom and gloom and just don't go so basically one day a long time after that my family were amazing Eve my daughter and Jimmy my son and all my family and everyone in Tenby where we lived they were brilliant and I looked at the map of the world and I can't talk too much about this because I know we'll run out of time but I thought yes I, I can do it you know Yes. I think now it's not a, it's not an eighth, it's not a one step is the beginning of a thousand miles. It's the eighth of a step. And Stephen Seaton, the then editor of Runners World, it was a superbly kind. He paid me for stories, and I didn't yet write to give me some money. And everyone was amazing because I decided I am going to do some running. And I knew that if I did the London Marathon, I might make more money. But then, of course, since several pe- many people do great stuff there and they run better than me, it's like finding another way through still. I mm-hmm. thought, I can run around the world. And it will be the package tour on foot. I had no particular money. Runner's World supported me generously, not with money, but with a lone sat phone at one point, <coughs> paid for my articles <coughs> and gave me enough to start. <coughs> yeah. So after that, I was so rented my house and... On my 57th birthday, I stood on the flagstone of my house and just my son and about five people saw me off and my my brother drew the outline of my foot on the flagstone and it wasn't going to be the sort of run where you go home for Christmas. We had, There's no money. I had a rented house, a bit of savings and it's a mm-hmm. great kit, which, you know, which I still believe in. Absolutely. I'm a huge backpack, which is nearly killing me. And I just <laughs> went off and I didn't see that footstep again for 20,000 miles. So to cut a long wow. story short, I was nearly dying of pain by the time I got to, I, sorry, I ran to ran to Harwich and I did the talks on the way to try to build up the coffers, which I really need to do now too very badly. Yeah. Things changed. And then I took the ferry to Holland and then I ran across Holland and Germany and Poland and Lithuania and Latvia and Riga to Moscow. And then I was really looking at the ground a lot, bent over by about 22 kilos. And my gosh, I was trying to visualize, my dream was to be a lightweight runner. So I, I felt given by chance a, a baby jogger from Mother Care Moscow. So that was great. And that went yeah. 2,000 miles over the Ural, Ural Mountains. I, I, I'd start in October, so I had the easier winter. Already lots of adventures on it, meeting people all by myself, self-supporting. I had a small, I, well, didn't have to be sleeping out, but I didn't have a big budget. I had a small emergency fund that I could stay in a place now occasionally if I needed to or to charge things. I didn't have any iPhones. It was just before the era of all that yes. time capsule. So anyway, I ran over the Euros with Columbine, the baby jogger, and then I ran to Omsk. And people said, how did you get here? I said, I ran here. I said, no, no, you're going to run. But I mean, how did you get here? I said, I ran. It was crazy. And then the director thought they wouldn't recognize me because I wasn't very well known unless I pulled the buggy. That was baby jogger all the way around. But meanwhile, Runners World had sponsored me Hercules, designed by Steve Holland, who does great stuff around finds. He had yeah. wheels before, but he evolved it. <laughs> Hercules was great. Before I got Hercules, I had to run the marathon with the baby jogger, Columbine, and I think I collected five kids on board on the way. And it was, well, I just made it in time, five hours or something. And it was wildly exciting. Hercules was iron tub. It wasn't the thing you could live in. So I had a tent. Mercifully, it was good because when it got cold, I wouldn't have been able to pack it with enough clothes. So anyway, I, my idea was just to eat what I had, a buckwheat, uh, Fact. Tell, tell us, tell us about Hercules. What did, what, Hercules what was card. Again, I have a lovely picture of of Seahorn's wife Alex pulling it with the two kids who are now grown up, one married and one at, the, at the university, uh, in it as kids. And he, it, it was the first thing he designed, especially for me. It was made out of iron. 
because we figured mm-hmm. if it crashed, which it did actually when I got run over by a bus once, it could be fixed <laughs> in Russia, you know, because basically, uh, you know, you can weld iron easily, more easily than aluminium, so I understand. So basically I had Hercules. Hercules was a, a very overlaid because I, I had... Very- just, just so everyone knows, so in case anyone who hasn't seen your book, Hercules is your, basically your home that you oh, no, pull I mean, around the world with you. Yeah, no, no. I have to quickly put in a, an explanation. If that's yes. okay. Yes. Well, first of all, there was me with a backpack, disaster. Yep. Then yep. there was me with a with a little baby jogger, Columbine. It was very fragile. And yep. then there was Hercules in Omsk. But Hercules completed the whole of Russia, and I had a, I just had a little bivouac with three you know three pit things all the way through Russia because that's all I had. And then I, I know, towards the end of Russia, I got a tent because I had too many clothes. It was minus 40, minus 30. Very tricky to stay alive, even then. But mm-hmm. once I got, I didn't go across the Bering Strait. There wasn't any, there was a little later, but I couldn't have done it. I had no special stuff. I went to Magadan, and then I took a ferry to do the Wales on the, on the western point of the American continent, you know, Wales, Alaska. And mm-hmm. then Hercules wouldn't take the snow. It was just a... It didn't suit that snow. It was a hundred yards a day with me taking all the kit out and hauling it. But the people, because I'd run from the Bering Strait to over the mountains that used to have people, but now nobody goes there because they can go by aeroplane or by. I had to go in October. Time was important with seasons. I had to leave in October when the ice wasn't very hard in order yeah. to get to the Yukon River by the time it froze because the tundra would have been impossible in the, in the summer. So I had, I had I tried with Hercules. Oh, man, I'd take the wheels off and we got stuck all over the place. And when I arrived in Nome, the reason the lovely love, as befriended by the lovely uh, lovely assistant, uh, whatever it is, I don't know, maybe a lawyer, well, I can't remember what they call it, strict attorney, yeah. And he said the reason he didn't ask his, his policeman to, to stop me for my own good was that I'd managed the valley. And on the way, I, met, I was alone for five days doing that. And I ran out of food except for one t- little bit of lumps of walrus blubber that Eskimo had given me. And I, I, I underestimated things completely. And I've never done it again. I thought, 60 miles, come on. I can't need three packs of spaghetti. But <laughs> it was a blizzard and I was alone. I remember, all alone. And there was, I had by then a garment, but the maps were bad. So there was three mountain valleys and one, two would be a dead drop. And the ice was always shifting. So basically, you couldn't trust me. I was going forward on my stomach before taking Hercules. This is for before mm-hmm. I got to know. So when I got to know, they befriended me, were lovely to me, sweet to me, and they loaned me, got a loan of a I did a rod sled. You know, the husky uh, yes, people yeah. run it as a as a thing, which is a great thing. Now I was loaned this and it had a tent on it. So instead of spending three hours trying to crush heavily frozen tents into some sort of manageable shape, and also I was running out of food because again I couldn't I couldn't handle it you know I couldn't make you can't when it's colder than minus 30 and it was regularly minus 30 35 40 uh, you can't really cook outside I had very in Russia I had disgusting petrol with all due respect but here uh-huh. it was so cold minus so I went to the Kaltag portage trail at Bering Sea coast that links the the thing to the river and do you know what it was minus 62 celsius hard to stay alive wow. but anyway that's not about this i finished the run around the world i broke my ribs many times i was swept away by rivers knocked unconscious one down one river there's no time because there's so much has happened since you know joe i just can't can't say it but i arrived home and i did the second footprint and then i realized after the last footprint there's a next footprint for all of us yeah. <laughs> wow you do you- I do just want to ask you one. There, there is one thing I want to ask you about your run around the world before we talk about your because you, you have done so many different adventures. What was it like to be followed by wolves? Oh, I, I woke up. Well, the fact is, you know, funnily enough, you can go on great training when you're in, in comfortable surroundings on how to have resistance and bravery. And but when you're bloody well got to do it, you know, <laughs> they, there's an there's an Icelandic saying, not from not there, but later, need makes the naked lady spin. If you've got the handle of wolf packs, you can do it. And I knew you don't run from puppies. Even friendly puppies will nip your heels. So he came yeah. in my tent. And I, I, this big temple wolf. I was every night camping in the forest in the snow, learning to make tea from tree bark and eating buckwheat for breakfast, lunch, and tea. And I heard this sort of noise. 
next minute he, he was looking at me and I was really upset and now he's going to kind of chat me up or eat me but it was very frightening and if, I, if I'd run from him he'd have killed might have killed me because wolves are very friendly and everyone loves wolves but in Siberia they, if they're hungry they will kill you not yeah. in America you know they're lovely and then they follow it's, I can't tell the whole story because you haven't got time but eventually the wolf pack followed me for 10 days and I didn't dance with the wolves and I didn't make pets of them but I, but I just tried to move along and they followed me as they were seeing me out of their terrain and I what kept me going was the reason I think for one of there's all sorts of tricks I can tell you like my socks and how I managed the physical things but you all know that what the main thing that me going I'm sure, I think I know it's the same for a lot of runners I had this powerful reason to do it because I felt mm-hmm. I was just an ordinary person a very ordinary runner but I had experience experience and practical things but the thing is if it saved one life having seen my husband die in my arms him go on a journey and then me like many others go on a journey for the sake of people they love for various reasons to lose i was going to do it if it took everything i got yes wow well if anyone hasn't i would recommend reading just a little run around the world no but i'm still going you know it's 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 brilliant i I loved it so so so, yes so lots of things happened in between you don't want to yes really important is now if we have time we'll go backwards but what let me tell me about now a turning point are you up to now when i was i you see, a few years before, I'd run across America and blah, 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 blah. And that eventually got buggies. Once a buggy succeeded another, and the one I've got now is the best I've ever had. And it's quite old. And I've just got it back from Turkey. But I digress. So what happened, the next big turning point, among many, as there's no time to talk about, is that it's very dangerous ladies doing housework because I had just finished a project living out on the beach for the homeless and doing something for them. And I thought, well, we're going to go to the laundrette. It was a beautiful, frosty morning. Uh, the last day of the year, well, it was the 28th of December, 2017, nearly, nearly 2018. And I, I, I just slipped the smallest puddle you ever saw. There was a bit frozen. Crash! And I was looking up at this circle of faces and my hip was broken. I couldn't even, it was hanging off nearly because basically I damaged it a few times, falling on the ice and things. And mm-hmm. I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up with anybody help. I could not. It was, the pain was terrible. When and was this, Rosie? When this, was this? This was the 28th of December, 2017. Okay, so it's fairly recently, yeah. It, yeah. At home, really, at home. In home, near Brighton, where I am now. And yeah. everyone was amazing to me. And I digressed then. And, and on the way, the ambulance had to come and get me. And I was telling them, I'm going to run around the world again. I'm going to run. And I, all the morphine was talking, you know. And they were saying, yeah. yeah. And it was so great. And then the surgeon took a look at me, and he really didn't think much of it. He had, I lived mostly in the, on the seafront doing projects. One of these crazy people, like, that's going to just wreck my work. But bless him, he, they, he didn't replace it. He pinned it because I had good bones from the running, see? And then I was thinking, Chris, it's the end because I'm 70 or 70. Yes, I was 70 or 71. I can't remember what, but it was that time anyway. And I thought, that's it. When you break your hip, then there's curtains. But I had amazing friends. The park run is one of my favorite things. Yeah. And I, 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 first of all, I'm, I was on, I had my friends wouldn't let me go camping till I could get off the floor by myself. And frankly, I had to stay in a hotel for a few. It was a lovely, lovely place. But the main thing was that my friend said, you've got to get off the floor by yourself. So I was up there with a night man, not drinking anything, but in the bar. And because he could help me if I couldn't really get up. Once I could get up, my other friend, Claire, she took me finding a campsite. And then I stayed in what I'm in now. I come back to it. It's really like a home in England. And they I, I gave me the biggest tent, just a normal belt, cheap tent. Um, not cheap, but, a, you know, a normal tent. But they put mm-hmm. Glory, she wanted to put a radiator in it. They fussed me, they spoiled me. That's why I'm starting on this run. They were amazing. And when I still couldn't run, they let me do an ice bucket challenge for the nurses and added extra ice cubes. It was snowing, which was that winter. Was snowing. So it was, they were stunning. And lots has happened since. And then I, when I, four months later, I managed to hop when I was allowed to fly and took no medicines after I left the hospital. I'm mm-hmm. pretty strong inside from all the training of running. But yes. four months after, I took plane when I was allowed to fly uh, off because of the, you know, whatever. But you get, you get sort of um, any air in your blood or something stupid. I can't remember. It's not stupid. But anyway, I went to America, to Texas, where that buggy I'm using now was being stored by a lovely, lovely friend of mine. And mm-hmm. I pulled it on crutches, hopping, and thinking, gosh, I'm wrecking everything all the way to Dallas, where I, I sent it home, I freighted it home. And 
and really, and then I hopped put the suitcase to the airport again, and then I came home, and I was thought, that's finished me off, but I got stronger. And then the week before I'd broken the hip, I, I just, I, I'm leaning up to this present day. The week before, I'd been planning a trip to run to Berlin because what, that book you've just mentioned, it was kindly coming out of a very sweet young German publisher that really needed support. So I thought I'll run there for fun. And so I, I hadn't been able to because of the broken hip. So I thought, yes. So uh, I think it was in, two, so I, I broke the hip in, in December 2017. As far as I remember, it was in June. Or I went off June or July. Uh, I can't remember, but that in the summer sometime, I yeah. ran from Brighton to Hove and then to all the way, not was it North France, Belgium, uh, Germany to Berlin, and I thought I'm getting stronger. And then I went home to do a speech for this wonderful charity, Phase Worldwide. You see, Clive had had a dream. The first mm-hmm. dream he had after after Marathon this was we were going to, I was going to, we we're going to go to Nepal and help the people there. He didn't want to come along just like a spare watch at his, Rosie runs and I'm support. No, we were, he's a practical guy, very good at electrics and everything, and mm-hmm. we were going to help. And then when he got sick, he said, I'm going anyway, but he didn't. So I thought, way to go. And the lovely Jonathan who's listening now, he said, well, would you, and also there's an argument as to who really said it, because the lady was staying with, I went up to, to Cumbria to do a conference for Face Worldwide to give a very bad talk, but that one stopped like now. And uh, bless them, they said, he said, it was one of the, would you run to Nepal for us? We run for Nepal for Face Worldwide, practical help achieving selfie bump. And I thought, yes, because previously I've been planning, yeah, I've had an interesting life. You know, I sailed around Cape Horn and I rode down Chile and horseback. My previous idea had been, let's go to the countries where I have memories. Like my poor mum died when I was two. I had a hard childhood. But after I was brought up by the postman in Davos, and that's another story, when I did this for South by Marathon and met her when she was nearly 100 again. And my grandmother was the one, the first person that said, it isn't good looks or natural gifts, lucky few child wanting to do things. And I wasn't a, a delightful creature. I was an ugly, gawky, worst runner in school. I was so embarrassed and upset. But eventually, encouragement, if love is the best short word in the dictionary, encouragement is the best long word. Because I'd met the Tenby Turkeys when I was nearly 15. That's why all that I've described has happened. They said, they said, they didn't say, they said, you know, you're not doing so bad. They said, if you can run a marathon, you can't be Tenby Turkey unless you can run a marathon. And all these lighter clad supermen, young men with great speed, they slowed down. And, you know, that's the real magic is real magic, is encouragement and love. It's not really rabbits out of hats and things, although they're fun. So anyway, uh, after that, I thought, yes, run the Catman do when you're 72 or whatever, 73, whatever it was. I thought, that's amazing. But I wasn't going to come back. I started from England when I ran across America, blah, blah, various different journeys. So I was going to continue from Nepal because reality and running are, are very, uh, and, and dreams and goals are the same, aren't they? I, I am a, I'm, was very fit by now, except the, 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 the still a bit healing. But mm-hmm. basically, I haven't got as much time ahead of me as I have behind me. So basically, you have to choose what to do. And you can, as a runner, all runners, know how to change pace and adapt to the situation, don't they? Uh-huh. So basically I thought I'd better keep going from, and I'm going to go all the way, a long way round. All my journeys are a long way round. Yeah. Reasons, I had to go to Vienna, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I set off and I ran through approximately 3,000 miles and through exactly 12 countries from England. So, so you set off from where to where? Okay. Give us that again. Let me try and... I, 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 I apologize, this is not very good. No, it's great. Right. You, you, you are so infectious. What I have to say is what happened was, I, because time is precious, I didn't go back to England and start again. Mm-hmm. It's very important. This is really the crux of what I'm talking about. Really the best thing in the whole world, what's happening now. Mm-hmm. I decided that I would run the Kathmandu from Berlin and raise the money for phase worldwide. We've got the link here. I know you're going to give it out and everything, but it was just very important. And it didn't do very well, but I did my best. And I continued from Berlin, very low profile, through Czech Republic, Austria, Slovakia, all through Hungary, all through Serbia. By then I knew how to do it, how to do it. I learned a lot, you know. And yeah. I had very hardcore equipment, good equipment. And eventually, after many, many countries, I arrived in Turkey and there and a big long story there why I got to do a reception later. But anyway, when I eventually got to Galata Bridge, I had loads of publicity for the first time, made a few thousand pounds at long last for that very needy charity, where even a pound buys a bag of seed potatoes and helps 
these proud people grow their own stuff. So I went across Galata Bridge and now this news and other, uh, many other things at 8 million hits or many millions. Amazing. But that was great. And they closed the Bosphorus Bridge, especially for me. The municipality out of Istanbul are amazing. The police were very kind. Everyone was amazing. And then I was on my way in Zafribola when COVID struck. And I was stopped because I was only 62. In fact, I'm very, very much older. And, yeah. I, and the funny thing is, then magic, like today, magic happened today. I, I have to digress. The Hilton saved me. They owned the, they, it stay, was going to stay for two nights because I was dreaming of crispy sheets and charging my phones after being in the mountains. The lovely man, Ahmed, he... I think it was, I remember he's the manager, a highly thought of manager. But now there's only a few people, staff, no kitchen, no jacuzzi, no nothing. But I, but, but when lockdown happened, they brought a, somehow they brought a gigantic exercise machine that wouldn't even fit the lift up to my room. They said, when you can keep going. Because I was on my track. My idea from, from Saffron Bola had been to finish my run through Turkey and then go to Georgia, Azerbaijan, across the Caspian Sea by ferry, then Turkmenistan, et cetera, et cetera, to Kathmandu. And there was a hope because it was in March when I stopped. And yes. because I was over 65, you're, you're banned to leave the house. And so I did stop. And that was it. And then, because COVID continued for everybody, we've mm-hmm. all had to find a different way around and a million different paths, haven't we? Many mm-hmm. people. I had to come home eventually, but my beloved cart was left there. And, oh. that was, and it'd been there a year. And then, in between lockdowns here, I got my heavier cart, inspired by my grandson, Michael Stanway. I decided that I'd never done it to run from Land's End to John O'Groats, again, with deviations to the middle of the sea, you know, Sarah Williams and different people. And after that, I, I, um, I, I did that, and it took a long time because I kept stopping and doing things. And so this is, sorry, sorry to stop you. So, so you, ran, you got to Turkey. You had to stop because of COVID. So you've then, so you've already ran thousands of miles, yes. and then you've, you've come back to the UK. And in your downtime, you've decided to do. Was it jog or all the jog? Let me let I just try to this. This is a very important. I haven't got it very good, but I want to just tell you what happened when I got back to that caravan site, South Downway Caravan and Camping, was my lovely, wonderful grandson who is 18 or he keeps getting old and taller than me he came he came to cycle to see me and he was going to cycle to scotland and he and so i thought oh wait i can't go to turkey but i can do something it was one of the occasions we were permitted to do i thought i can i can do something i'm meant to do this and i thought it'd be a me- i'd never done it and also after the round the world run i'd arrived back in scotland at poignant memories so i thought yes i must keep strong and this rather heavier one it'll be fine and uh it's a big story in itself, but that became an important run because it took ages. And I met several lockdown and I kept the head of tier one, but the mm-hmm. people coping, like the lady suffering the, from depression, who was so depressed, and then her husband says, why did you do a bit of baking? You love it. So she's now making cheese board. She bought me a cheese board at midnight. I was still doing the same thing, very good at COVID, because I was still self-isolating, cooking my own food, not very rarely staying in hotels. And, you know, I could if I wanted to, but mostly I would, 90% of the time I was just sleeping in the fields. My technique would be, like in, in the way to Turkey, that I would run as well as I could all day and do things. But then yep. I would find a field in the night because I was tired. Therefore, I didn't have the energy to talk and or to get out of any difficult, if they were ever aware of any situations as they went. So I would sleep and be wakened by bunches of stray dogs all the way through that terrain and it all joined me for breakfast and yeah. very friendly and then I would have my tail up in the morning after several cups of delicious coffee because I'm a decadent woman you know I don't believe in austerity and then I would run with my happy and fresh to the village and have tea with everybody because I could do it then you know it's, it's a question of finding the way to do it because if, if I'd gone in the evening it would have been difficult I, and mm. This changed later because poli- when I became no- for you know, a little bit unknown because of the bridge, they used to think it was dangerous for me, but it was really dangerous what they were suggesting. I have to sleep in the town car park, you know, mm-hmm. or a hotel. With- but never mind. So I did that, and, but, and then I came back and did the same to John O'Groats. I, very, I went to see many people on the way. I had to do the, from the assignments, but I met the most extraordinary people. At, to start with, I met people... To- one man just out from jail after three years armed robbery, who was absolutely delightful and looking to the future, just been he was in the hostel and he's now had a job at one of the supermarkets in the back, you know, loading things. They uh-huh. all made and there was these great people. I met the somebody grand man in Bristol, but I also met the guys, a guy who trying to make his way in the world and and, and, and making dog toys, you know, after being homeless. And 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 then 
I suddenly became who I was more than that. I got the call of the North. I thought I thought it was just an exercise run. I thought, no, oh, I love the North. It's a good place. It seems hard, but I know the snow. And by the time I'd gone, got the John the Great's on Christmas Day, the day before total Scottish strict lockdown, I, I'm going to take a ferry straight to Norway and up to Lapland. This was not, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not like that. And that buggy... The one that I had there would have been totally, it's very good for what it is, but it's too heavy for taking t- skis and, and actually not quite a strong construction because it's not meant for it. So I came back and it was hard enough to get back. The chief constable, John the Gross, and Bet, uh, uh, Katie Hunter, gave special permission for me to run some of the way home because the borders were closed. And then a very kind truck of friend, uh, friends of friends of friends and good, like my good friend Nick Cragg, he got a friend of his to, to he. A lot of the way I had to travel separately it was very difficult. This somewhere in January, I can't remember the dates. But anyway, I thought, oh, yes, 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 yes. And then I thought, and it's better than if it hadn't gone wrong. For me, not for millions of people, sadly, but for me, because I can start away from England. It isn't let's recover or reset, it's start again. So roses round the Kathmandu reborn with a proper send-off. And by the way, I'm the oldest woman by many, many years, but I never entered to have gone from Land's End to John O'Groats at all, uh, even not pulling something, but I never entered. But this time I will for fun, because after all, it's great fun when you get older. It's a great chance to do things in a special way, because why not? And anyway, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm getting ready. When do you, when do you start? When do you start? I'm your starting own... on the 20th. I, I, I've learned one thing, Joe. 25th of June. I've learned mm-hmm. that if you are determined enough, the way parts for you as much as it can. And it happens in a big way and a little way. So I suddenly, I've learned. I don't care what. I know I can run. I've got two, two COVID jabs. I went, the doctor will write it all out get all the precautions I can to be allowed to go, but I can run the Harwich. So I'm leaving at midday on the 25th of June from South Downway that nursed me so beautifully and was so good to me. And all the people of Hassocks, I'm celebrating Hassocks, my village, and Brighton and Hove, and the whole of England. There are such special people I met on the way to John O'Groats and in Scotland. Oh, man, up in Betty Hill. Oh, where, where, do you, where do you meet those people? Are they, are they are they when you're running or is it when you're stopping the evening and they saw you and they see the buggy or where where, where do you today. mostly get to meet these people? Let me tell you about today. This has happened yeah. since then, multiplied when I'm not when I'm running longer. I I um had a very busy day yesterday. The great people at Hove. The, I pay also I pay for everything. I never ask for a discount. I never do anything because you choose the people you need. You, and, then, and then they become fake mates. You try, you, I have any people I love in my cart. You know, I don't say, oh, please, could you do it free? Could I have a discount? I don't do that. I already had a great success at run, run, the run shop here at Bletchington Road because, yes, they, they just they didn't even measure your feet. You can see the size. Is it really runners? And that's the best shoes I've ever worn. But I did all that. But this morning, it's been a right hustle. To, do, to fit it all in. So yesterday I was doing the logos and we got it in the evening. Then I went to, to see my son. Then I parked it in the road in Hove and it was fairly boring, but I know it was about 10 o'clock. That's the way to be. You know, it was quite quiet in a certain place near a bin. There was a little bit of uh, road work, so it was a bit confusing as to what I was. But I wasn't hiding, but it just it's kind of become invisible by the way you think. And then mm-hmm. after that, at midnight, because it was really dull there, I ran to the seafront and I slept with the sound of the waves until about three. And normally I'd be doing my, my mathematical training because I like to do extra things when I'm older to exercise the brain, and mm-hmm. if I have any. <laughs> but anyway, this time I had this feeling, my, my gut feeling that all runners have was becoming stronger and stronger because I used to be listening to it and I knew I had to leave. So instead of leaving the buggy where in, in, in Hove, I, I ran all the way to Brighton, not very far, but I didn't bother washing, didn't bother cooking, as you can probably see. I had to get to here. But on the way, what did I meet? First of all, I met a lovely man who had come down to London and hoped to do the London Marathon. Then mm-hmm. I met a, a man lying on the bench, a nice young man, and he really looked he was very, he was obviously homeless. And I said, Oh, I said, well, I've got, you know, I had about 10 pounds. Let's have a half each, you know, have some breakfast. And with a lovely time, I bought him a little breakfast. I didn't, I just gave him the money. And then I carried on. Mm-hmm. And then, oh, man, what's the next thing? I mean, I, everywhere people, and then I met another guy. I suddenly, on the way, it evolved this idea. I have to have good Wi-Fi. What am I going to do? I was going to go back to my son, Jim's, but I thought I can't go back before for like this. So I I remember the Hilton in Saffron Bolo that looked after me for two months. And 
I, I was on the front there with uncombed hair, just like I am now. And I went in there and the charming manager here, uh, they've got this, I, I'm not I'm not paid by the Hilton. I'm not sponsored by them. I just want to tell you there's something special because they'll do things when you when you need, not just for money, you know. And basically, he let me have this room for an hour and a half free. I've got their elite Wi-Fi. Uh, I, I rushed off to, to Apple to get – and again, the top best man came and he knew this machine. He helped me. And then I went to Costa's where they were so kind, and I plugged a few things in. And then – I kind of went back and forth. And then I had to come back here and I thought, oh my gosh, that's the buggy. Anyway, I, sat, I arrived in this room seven minutes before you called me and then Jonathan was standing by and we've done it. You know, at least we've got this far. So this is so special. I've learned, just like an elite marathoner, which I never will be, that you can you can win at the last minute. If you keep your nerve and keep going and keep thinking agile, I thought, I can do this. I can't do that. I can do that. Yeah. And whoop, we're there. Sweet. And that's happened several times to me recently. I've learned so much from running. So we, we we've spoke a couple of times re- leading up to this, haven't we? I'm I am completely in awe of your nah, your mindset because you 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 said to me on the phone last week. You said I'm 74 and now I've got all these wonderful adventures ahead of me. And I'm like I was talking to my dad last night. He's 72 and I can't imagine him ever picking the phone up to me and just going, Joe, I'm I'm running off to Kathmandu. <laughs> what what's um and your enthusiasm, it is, it's your mindset. Even yeah. even for learning how to do this podcast, you, you've been so enthused with it and the way you describe the people at the Hilton then you so it's infectious. But what what's still what's still driving you to because these challenges you do, they're not it's I mean, they're so mentally and physically demanding. It, it is hard what's to still it. driving you to, to do that now? Well, it's very interesting because I do pull the pod, 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 the pod because it's so helpful. It teaches mm-hmm. you agility to start with because you can't just run on a path and you can't just go on the road. You just keep thinking about it. But I do mm-hmm. look. I ran all the way around the world, and most of my life I was fueled by passion and maybe sorrow and devastation because my husband was we a. We used to dress each other in tinsel at Christmas. It was him <laughs> and me, and you know, it was just we were. Totally a love story, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, and that was sorrow that drove me. But happiness is a bit of a pathway. I don't do it to prove I'm a grand great runner or the old, uh, uh, anything. I only would say I'm the oldest. If it was useful for phase worldwide. Don't forget to put the link in. But I also, I've got happier. Also, my mind. I've realised that the, the the big deal is in the head. Really older, and and I know that my best times now. Your best time, because you're a very fit man, would have been perhaps when you were younger because you've gone incredibly fast, like nearly all runners, because I was incredibly useless. My knees used to go out of joint. Now I've got a wonderful a wonderful guy called Sam up in Derbyshire. He, a friend bought me a session with him, and now he's I've got his logo up. He, he said, I've got potential. He said, if he had me for six weeks, I could run till I'm 92. I love it. And also I'm taking more care. I used to assume I was strong. And I was to be falsely proud. Yeah, you sailed across the Atlantic. Surely you can do that. But now I know you can't. It's just specific for a person like me to have the right shoes, the right food, and to kind of look off my mind. That's mean I do a little bit of mental exercises, a little yeah. very haphazard, but not sort of sanctimonious uh, meditation, like practicing, and I can count backwards from 20 sort of lamp posts and that and sort of thing. I've become a lot stronger and more determined since Turkey, because Turkey, I love Turkey deeply, but it was a very last hard last week. I had to stand up to a rather important, uh, police are wonderful, were wonderful to me, but one man, it wasn't his fault, but I had to stand up to prevent him destroying my cart. And so, you know, I had a hard last week yeah. but I, uh, and I'm going back to do the 2023 marathon with the runners there there's 80,000 of them that do running for charity uh, on the marathon you know and very very Istanbul, hmm? is that Istanbul Adam, is Adam, it? yeah Adam Adam they're called Adam Adam yeah. I don't know how you pronounce it but they're great buddies I've got some extraordinary Turkish friends and I'm having a little Turkish flag with me because they were in tears when I had to leave, I was hoping just to put oh. on track the harness on my back. It was in the best reserved place in the Hilton car park in Saffron Bolo. It, and they were like running on minimal wage. You know, it's devastationally hard. So I did it. So my plan right now, as you need to know my plan, is yes. I am working like a, 
fury because although I'm spending more money than I have, which is why I ought to do a few podcasts. I don't mean podcasts, little Zoom talks, you know. I've already done it for the Orion runners who were the first, and I had to learn how to do both Microsoft and, and Keynote and insert films, uh, with videos and slides, and it all worked out just so it was wonderful. And like I said, I'm available from inside my podcast, at least while I'm in England, for Everything from a five or upwards is perfectly acceptable. I don't do things for any particular amount of money. I don't care. But I do could use a little more, but I don't care. So I learn things. And now I'm specific. I, I respect my mind. If I had, I didn't have it for you, which is why this podcast is not doing very well. But normally I'd stop and have a cup of tea and I would relax, and maybe listen to one bit of music. And then I'd get masses more energy. That's mm-hmm. my trick now. But it, this morning was a little bit wild and woolly, but still, you know, I had a nice drink of some green stuff that I slugged down my throat on the way still here. You've got plenty of energy, Rosie. I <laughs> had more energy than before because I never looked after myself before and I never had any training. Now I'm trying to improve my I'm very, very strong legs, but my knees need more muscle. I had a, a, a bruised mm-hmm. ligament for the, from the snow in Scotland and I, mm-hmm. although I'm very bendy. I can touch my hands on the floor. I'm very stiff at the back. So I've got this wonderful Sam. I, I don't know the name of his business, but he's, he's great. And so is a lady called Natalie, who's just, she, she's, she's got, she's marvellous. I haven't been to her, but I'm great. She, so I've got lots of people looking after me now. So I'm elite. You see, when I'm young, I'm not important. But now I'm definitely cool. I can get, I'm on your podcast to start with, which is a huge honour for a silly runner like me. So you can oh, tell me, I'm lovely. really, really excited about being old. It gives you, if you, it gives you huge chances. All runners know that because you can get best of age category and be wildly proud. But with me, it's even wider than mentioned. Everyone does what I say. I mean, today, uh, I'm, you know, the curry, I'm, I'm not promoting particularly, the curries, the apple store, the, the man on the beach that wanted to, me to look up to look after the cart for me, but I didn't think it would work really if too many people jumped on it because it offered people. And then the, the, the wonderful hotel here that immediately understood and given me the best conference hall you know it's just it used to work in big ways now it's working in little ways and and it's just so exciting i think the next 10 years but I'm, my plan is to run to Kathmandu and then mm-hmm. to go to the high Kashmir, maybe running or maybe not because there's a school there where the, a wonderful man uh, has mm-hmm. recently died to set up Sheffield College for Girls. And mm-hmm. but after that, my plan had been to come home with Ice Chick and I'll freight her home because she's my baby. I'll do something. I'll keep hold of her. And then I'm going to do many, many park runs everywhere. Yeah. Plus, I'm going to run marathons in places like Antarctica. But I'm not going to, unless at least until I'm 90, I'm not going to do any more round-the-world runs because I love my family. My daughter's amazing and my son is stunning and he's been helping me so much. And my grandchildren are now I'm a person who can be of use to them. I wasn't very good at it, you know. I was a way a lot when they were young, God bless them. And I've never had the handle of really using cooking well in the house and doing things. I can cook, of course. And school runs, I haven't done it. I mean, I can drive and I can do anything I want. The funny thing is, Joe, because everybody can do anything if they set their mind to it. You've got to choose what is the most valuable thing to do for you. It might be cooking. For me, it's, I've learned a little bit. I'm not as good as many people but most of all is the will and the passion the best thing is you should do anything at this except uh with passion and if you do something that isn't with passion you've got to keep thinking of a way around it to do something else or to to change it sometimes you can change things a little way because i run for love and happiness and I, as you mm-hmm. say on my buggy it's just got a, a sort of a thing that looks partly like a heart and partly like a, a sort of you know bubble and, it's, and I'm going to put people on. Oh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. It's, I have to, a few stickers from people, but I'm also going to have, I've got a huge blackboard on top. Children are going mm-hmm. to go on it. But I can say when I come to Brighton in two weeks, I'm going to come to say goodbye. Uh, I can put, uh, thank you, Brighton. And when I'm in the yeah. middle of, of Norway, I can do that. So it's much better than too many stickers. People can't understand. So it's a universal thing. Because I mm. you ask who's the special people I've met. It's everybody. I've been through some of the worst dangerous areas in America and the best. I've slept in Manhattan and the Bronx and in Gary Indiana where there's a murder now. Because people are people. And I know how to handle people who are fragile. I'm not mm. trained. I'm not a psychologist. My daughter is. She's brilliant. But me, I just, I just don't show fear because that, of course, oh, that's insulting. And you don't mm. act rude. 
The latest, it was a lovely story. When I was in Inverness, stuck outside a cycle shop because everything was closed, I was just on the mm-hmm. pavement in the snow. Lots of lovely people came from a friend, lots of gorgeous people. But this time, I was two o'clock, I think I may have mentioned it, two o'clock in the snow, and there was voices behind me, loud and drunk, going, oh, there's a coffin, there's a coffin, and they were laughing. And I knew, oh my God, I better come out and show myself, or they might jump on it, which wouldn't be very good for it. This was the not... There's, just to let your, your listeners know that there are two jog pods. There's Ice Chick, which is the fast one, but the oldest yeah. prototype is infinitely valuable, a precious gift from Mike DeNoma and, and Steve Holland, the designer and uh, uh, the person that commissioned it for his, a race in the Arctic. And then there's Slick Chick that looks posher, but she was yeah. my office. Only Steve Holland would build me something for an office because I don't like being, I don't really like being in a house anymore, but she wasn't meant to go a long way. So, Anyway, I was in Slick Chick, having none other. And then these guys, oh, there's a coffin. So I stuck my head out. Oh, there's a person in the coffin. <laughs> man, it was two in the morning. I said, hello, guys, how are you? Oh, they had their phones out. I don't know if anything transpired or filming me. Oh, oh man, this is oh. So then I said, we're getting home now and have a good family. Oh, yeah, we'll go now. And so I, they, they, I saw them weaving down the road, talking about the person in the coffin. And then I just went back to sleep. So you made myself a cup of tea in the morning. And, and Jack yeah. and all my many friends that I made instantly in Vanessa. It's a fast track way to have amazing adventures and make yeah. your friends that you've only met for an hour, but you feel you've known them for 10 years. And I really want to say all the people in John O'Groves, I want to write to you all. But just like it is self-supporting um, is not just about eating your own grits and running alone. It's about mm-hmm. I've, I've still got to do the website. I've still got to build the then the back door, I've still got to do this, I've still got to do that, you know, and then I've got to minimize everything which I'm doing every day. So that's yeah. me. And the future... All I can say is I, I'm very, very blessed. There's people that do marathons, exceptional things that are severely in trouble and they fight against the odds and they've all inspired me. You know, people like Chris Moon, who I was lucky enough to meet and I, I was, did Marathon the Saab one year when I did it. These mm-hmm. and many others. But just because you haven't got a, anything wrong with you isn't a, a reason for thinking you might get something and sitting back. The older you get... If you're healthy, the crazier you should get. And you have to make decisions. My hair is a mess. So I have a, I, I just use very good shampoo. No longer do I bother the color is, and I don't put any conditioner on it. And I, I, I don't I protect myself, but I don't have, oh, I have makeup. I sometimes don't have a mirror, like a blind person wouldn't. So I have to somehow make, brush the teeth. And I've got a fantastic uh, dental hygienist because I like my teeth because I've got so much to smile about. And yeah. they're stepping in. Thanks to you've seen the book. I mean, it's, they're still going. Thanks to yeah. this lovely lady. I only saw her yesterday, and she gave me a beautiful toothbrush, electric one, the one she one of her own. People are just amazing everywhere. Rosie, remind how can people follow along Very your good. run to Nepal? Where where can they? First of follow? all, I'm running for Phase Worldwide, but mm-hmm. I have a, for the first time ever. For really, for the first time ever, I have I think. I can't remember quite, but the most major, I've got a Just Giving page. Mm-hmm. And you can look up just, what is it, www.justgiving.com uh, yep. slash fundraising slash uh, Rosie Swale Pope. And okay. also, I'm also, put, the thing is, I rarely do fundraise. I did for the prostate cancer people and made £200,000, but other people did. I don't like asking for money. But these people are amazing. So many, it's so lovely because they give give us so much because these guys don't get to stress. They cope in the hardest place. They're the people in the most isolated region of Nepal. They've got a start strong appeal. It's one of their special appeals as well as other things. Like if they just support the women, particularly the women and families to grow vegetables, to get trained as midwives, they can look after themselves. I can't mm-hmm. look after myself very well in the wilderness. Neither can they. So I'm inspired. And I'm also doing it for Clive because he wasn't this man that would have liked just to be remembered for some cancer and that. He, I'd be happy that I go to Nepal after all. So he's, you know, it's so good. Great. So, and you're, you're, on, you've, you're on Twitter, aren't you? No, you're on I'm Twitter. Also, I'm also on Twitter. And I'm also on Facebook, and I'm also yep. on Instagram, and I'm also on Wikipedia. I'm all over the jolly place. But the title <laughs> of this run, but that, that's not in the sort of just giving thing, is Rosie's Run to Kathmandu Reborn. Because like many people, we've been. I met people who had lost powerful jobs, like you know, event directors with millions of clients gone. So then they start running a 
running a dead dream of a cafe. Everyone finds a way through. But I believe it's an exciting opportunity. It's a dynamic because you're obviously, if you've got, let's say you're stuck somewhere on the road, you will have to take a way around it. On the way around it, you may discover something you'd never, never see otherwise. Certainly, my run to Nepal was a fine kind of idea and was very exciting. But now I'm going back to Russia. I'm going back to the Arctic. I'm going to the wonderful wonderful company phd gave me clothes i made a little jacket for clive when he had bone cancer weighing only 200 grams i'd do anything for them i'd give them my life but without being asked they they got they sponsored me again but but i didn't have any way to take pictures i don't have a camera so the wonderful local wedding photographer barry page he's sporting they spent three and a half hours up in the south downs which hardly need the clothes modeling this amazing padding padded gear it's wonderful down state of the art expensive down clothes when he's normally doing wedding dresses people like that blow your mind and, he, and he, I wasn't going to pay him. I didn't say, oh, would you do it for free? I said, what's the price? And he gave me a price. I said, yes, because it's important. But in the end, he said, it's so much fun. He wouldn't take a money penny for it. And they were a gift to, to the people. Uh, you know, Everyone's got their favorites. But uh, these people sew their stuff handmade in England, in, in Staley Bridge, drinking their tea in a sagging sofa, lovely ladies that used to work and whatever the industries wear for sewing and and you know peter hutchinson passed away from prostate cancer two uh, years some years ago it's very poignant but you do things for a reason but most of all you do them for joy like every day is an adventure you've got to make plans but then along the way things change like you might be doing all the training for a marathon but in the end you know you can just can't pass this and you can pass that you meet kids and kids and you shake their hands it's just a big marathon mm-hmm. well i i think the you, your your uh, personality rubs off on people, so I'm not surprised that I'm sorry, people love, exactly. love to support exactly. you like they do. It's um, well, please support me for phase of life if you feel you can. You know, don't worry if you can't. A smile will do, but be aware that even a, a pound or so is a huge help to the people out there, and they don't take any money. They have nothing. It all and I have no no expenses whatsoever from the charity. Yeah. I have a very small job as a patron of a wonderful little company called Nicola, Enable and Nicholas Associates Group. But I'm just because I'm their sort of what else brand ambassador and i'm so grateful i have no other money except my pension and if i if i do a few talks and i'm going to write a book again because everyone wanted me the publisher wanted a book but it didn't get me you don't write books for money you can wash dishes you cannot lose for money or do any old thing or do wonderful talks um, i've done some very highly paid talks too as well as ones for one pound you know but i don't go by price but anyway but you can't write books when you're my age because I'm 74, going to be 75. And I'm how, if I say I get a million dollars, well, you know, 10,000 pounds from, from a company, if to say I'm absolutely passionate about a certain brand of orange aid, even if I, it's perfectly harmless and very understandable for elite runners because they need a lot of money. But my freedom by being self supported, the most important freedom is I save a lot and I need to say what I think. So, because I'm going to Lapland, I am yeah. writing another book. I haven't run any proposal or got any any deal but i'm going to do it because you need to say what you think how are the kids going to believe if you take exercise and go running if you believe in yourself it may not always work but it always works better than if you don't you can't yeah. ask people yes you'll make it no but you will certainly can stand tall because you've given your best shot and i meet people around every corner who bring tears to my eyes and I believe feelings are important. You know, the really strong people are not the tough people. They're the ones who are hard and are tough inside. And I'm really trying to get fit inside my mind as well as outside my body these days. And I'm, yeah. it took me a long time. But I'm so happy that slowly I'm getting there. Well, Rosie, it's been absolutely lovely speaking to you. I, for one, can't wait to follow along from the 25th. Really looking forward to it. I, I wish you the very, very best on your upcoming adventure. And, um, yeah. I don't know I'm, I'm, how I'll fit it all in. There's a very nice young filmmaker coming, making a film of me this Saturday. So this afternoon, after I say goodbye to my to the run shop and to my son, I, I'm going to run over the over the Ditchling Beacon again because I've got to be there tomorrow because on Saturday morning, a young professional filmmaker that works long hours, you know, low pay, but he's very his dream was to, to make a 
four minute film which takes a day or two days because mm-hmm. it, it, apparently my runs helped his mum when she had anxiety so he's doing it for free I'm not being paid for it but I've got to be there on the dot at nine in the morning he's only got a day and we're going to be up to the beacons and he's going to he's got all these oh he's very exciting one of the people he's recruited to do it for free is actually the son of uh, uh, one of the finest filmmakers in the world. I'm not very good at documentaries, but years ago I did a film in in in, in my country in Central America, and that guy is now a little elderly, I think, but his son is doing. It. I couldn't believe it when they said it was the same name. So it's going to be an adventure, but I've got to stay strong. So after I've left you. Mm-hmm. Downtime. So what I'm going to do is run my buggy, thank the Hilton hugely, and look up mm-hmm. my pictures of, of I was on the Hilton website worldwide because they were I was doing exercises like running up Everest up the stairs there when I shut up. But basically then I'm going to have go run to run the hove from here, just a few miles, and then I'm going to see my son. I'm going to try to, if they're there, have a quick call in to run because the run and uh, Ruben and, and Kurt, Kurt's the dad, Ruben's the son. I want them to look at my son. He's not my son. He's not a runner yet, but he's got the bills and he's got one or two sport, old sports injuries. And I feel I'm no expert, but if you've got shoes that are really good, that's a hell of a first, you know, yeah. step. Yeah. You know, so it'll be more comfy walking around. And the same, um, um, I, ca- I can't afford much for that. You know, my son and daughter have got birthdays on the same day, one, two years after Park. Pa- you know, oh, my son was born on a sailing boat 40 uh, something years ago. Amazing. I can't believe it's the same me, but it is the same me. And I had, you know, all the stuff I fell around here for when I was young. But what I'm buying from now is the state of the art run socks, their birthday, because I haven't got any money. These are best socks I've ever worn. That's what they yeah. And then when I'm a little metal fear, I'm going to buy another pair for myself and get somebody to bring them out if I can. And I'm going to buy a pair for, for Jimmy and Eve because and maybe my grandson and daughter when I can because they, they didn't even touch me. I had my feet. What happened was I, mm-hmm. I went to a lovely little cafe. I thought I'd better go and use the bathroom. They'd probably have to run on the thing. He, he, I called him the day before just asked him if I could come. He watched me walk the road across the road without the buggy. He had a pair of shoes in his hand, one of those guys. He said, well, well, try these. And they were the best shoes I've ever had on my feet. There's no nothing in the windows. You almost think there's nothing for sale and nothing saying about Gate and other analysis, but they're hugely respected by the very top runners in Brighton area. But mm-hmm. my, if they put it on and they said, what about these socks? And I was dancing around with joy. And then I spent, and I didn't even ask the price. And I didn't ask for anything, but I just got them. And I think they gave me a little discount, but they do that to everybody, about 10% or whatever, maybe even more. And I've also won a friend called Kurt, who was also training triathletes, and he may have had a word with I don't know. But then I wanted some off-road shoes, because my off-road shoes are far too heavy. They're right so-and-so's, and they're critical. So, oh, yes, these won't be quite so comfy. Bruce, some beautiful, lightweight off-road shoes. I think they're, they're Pelican, you know. And they, uh-huh. they, I, so now I have all my feet, and I have the new tires on the thing, New tools, inners, slime, liners. I've, I can do it with nothing. But when you've got everything, grab it. And I'm spending the money now because if I have to get it on the way, I'll probably be more expensive and it won't be as good, see? So mm-hmm. I'm, but I've already yeah. got the wheels in Danbury on the way down. And I've been work. I, I, I think I told you, when it, after it arrived in the airport in Derbyshire, I walked and ran back and tried to do little jobs on the way like that. So anyway. Yeah. Rosie, thank you ever so much. Well, thank you think- very much, Joe. It's been delightful. And let's a big cheer for Faze Worldwide. And poor Jonathan, he works so hard. He's brilliant. And he's got a young, he's a baby or a young toddler. They've got a young wife, you know, he, they work, and he's one of the very few people employed in, with Faze Worldwide in this country. And I couldn't have done it without him because you can, you know, he's got the, that way of thinking like you have. We'll um well I'll I'll include on the link to the podcast all of your Twitter and Instagram and a link to your oh, just giving exactly. page as well. So you need any pictures at all? Do you need you have probably can find any pictures you see on the on the, any of these social medias if you want any you can grab them and if you need anything more ask me. And, and Thank so you. honoured to be interviewed by you. I'd rather ask about you than me anyway. But oh, every, no. I used to think I'm not special, but I've realised everyone's pre- special. Everyone's precious because everyone's only got themselves. So, you know, if I want to have a life, I've only got me. You have to be your own, you know, you really have to try to treat yourself a bit specially when you can so that you can do it 
My, my, my buggy wears socks on stones. I can pull it up 32 steps if I, well, 22, I did in thing. I can make it do difficult things. I run up the steepest hills, but if I've got to run it on pebbles on the beach, the stony beach, I've got cheap charity shop sort of soft things like socks or a bit of a vest or something. I know it's silly, but it's sparing the wheels. You know, they, yeah. they, they, yeah. like horse gets treated before a race. I'm not a racehorse, long or analogy, but they have bandages on their legs and their tails and everything. But mm-hmm. one day they may have to pull the stops out, and people are the same. And so that's why I tell you all, you runners who are listening at this, at the Joe's wonderful podcast, just be treasure yourself because honestly, nothing else works. Otherwise, it's no use being brave at something that could have been avoided. But by the way, then, when I broke my hip, the surgeon, several weeks later, he was very against me, but he absolutely, I'm his favorite person now because they did a scan and it couldn't yeah. even work it done. And he was beaming. And he's a, a, he's a I have to say, it was a, what is it? It's called Princess Royal Hospital in, in, in Hayward's Heath. And he's Benedict. Benedict Rogers, but I used to call him Roger Moore, and I never thought about that by mistake. You know, but he's a, they're just lovely. And I have to just tell you, when I broke my hip, those who went on drugs or you know big medicine, it was New Year's Eve I had in hospital. I was only there uh, one night, and that was maybe two nights. And they brought all the people, just a smattering of wine, just a little dribble, nice. and <laughs> wasn't that a wonderful thing? All those nurses worked so hard, yeah. and they weren't just being nice; they were taking blood, and they were dealing with people who couldn't understand what was going on, arranging uh, arranging ho- operations. And, you know, anyway, that's, I digress. It's other people who are special. Run is just the metaphor for the fact that everyone's special. Goodbye. <laughs> Sorry to come on. What a lovely way to finish. Thank you, Rosie.